This lecture is on the features of bonds. I am your professor, Dr. Stephen Haggard. Let's talk about some of the basic features of bonds. First of all, bonds are debt, and debt is not an ownership claim. You may hear people say that the bank owns their car because they owe so much money on it, but that's not correct. The owner of the car is the owner. The bank merely has a debt claim on the vehicle. As long as the owner continues to make their debt payments on a regular basis, the lender has very little to say about what the owner does with the asset. For instance, I owe money to Regions Bank for my house, but they can't tell me what color to paint my walls. They can't tell me whether I can change out my carpet for hardwood or anything of that sort so long as I keep up my debt payments and maintain the property in good condition. Another difference between a debt claim and a equity claim is the tax deductibility of the monies that are paid out. In debt, the pet company's payment of interest is considered a cost of doing business and therefore it is subtracted from the pre-tax income before taxes are figured. In other words, interest is tax deductible, whereas dividends are not. Unpaid debt is also a liability of the firm. What does that mean? It means that if the borrower fails to pay as promised, that gives lenders the right to take control of the assets. Now you may recognize this as repossession, which is what happens to people's cars when they fail to make their car payments, or foreclosure, which is what happens to people's houses when they fail to make their mortgage payments. Similarly, if a company issues bonds that are backed by assets, if they fail to make the payments as promised, the lender can take control of those assets. Now, something we do in finance, we talk about short-term debt, which is original issue maturity equal to or less than one year, and long-term debt, which has original issue maturity greater than one year. This concept of original issue maturity is important. Think about a bond that is issued as a 30-year bond. 29 and a half years later, it would still be considered long-term debt. Why? because the original issue maturity, that is, the amount of time to maturity on the date it was issued, was greater than one year. We further break down long-term debt into two smaller categories, notes, which have an original issue maturity between one and 10 years, and bonds, which have an original issue maturity greater than 10 years. Typically, 30 years is as long as we see a bond's life, but we may also see 40, 50, 100, or even a perpetual bond issued. The governments of Britain and Canada have previously issued bonds called consols, which have no maturity date whatsoever. They just keep going on forever and ever, paying coupons. Now let's talk about the bond indenture. An indenture is an agreement. In fact, in the early history of the United States, we had what were called indentured servants. These were people, usually young men, who would agree to serve for little pay and food, shelter, and training in exchange for a boat ticket to the New World. And the contract that they signed was called an indenture. These arrangements are no longer popular, but the indenture lives on in the world of the bond. The bond indenture is simply an agreement between the borrower and the lender, where each lays out their duties and promises to each other. And it contains information about the bond issue. This information includes the terms, security, seniority, repayment provisions, and call provision of the bond. Let's talk about the terms of the bond issue. These include the face value of the bond, which we know is usually $1,000, the coupon rate of the bond, the maturity date of the bond, in other words, the date on which the final coupon will be paid, as well as the face value, and then the form of the bond, 
There are basically two forms that bonds can take. There are registered bonds and bearer bonds. In registered bonds, your name, address, and social security number are on file with the borrower and they merely mail you your interest every six months if it's a semi-annual bond and at the same time they report that payment to the Internal Revenue Service. While interest is tax deductible for the corporation, the bondholder still has to pay his taxes on the interest received. On the other hand, we also can have bearer bonds and the very name tells you who gets paid. It's the bearer of the bond or the person who has the bond in their hands. Now this could be extraordinarily dangerous. First of all, there would be huge temptation for someone to steal bearer bonds because anybody with the bond in their possession can get paid. Secondly, such bonds can be used to hide income from tax authorities. In fact, bearer bonds are quite popular in Europe because high income tax rates there make tax dodging somewhat of a sport. And if you have bearer bonds for which you perhaps paid cash, you can receive coupons that are under the radar of your taxing authority. And so bearer bonds are actually quite popular for this purpose. Bearer bonds can also be used for laundering money and you can also uh, you could also have several problems with bearer bonds. First of all, what if a bearer bond burnt up in your house? Would you be able to call the issuing company and ask for a replacement? Absolutely not, because if that were the case, we would all call that company tomorrow and say that we had lost a bond. And so if you lose a bearer bond, it's gone. And secondly, as mentioned before, they are tempting targets for theft. Today we see that the overwhelming majority of bonds are registered for these reasons. Next we'll talk about the security of a bond. This is basically whatever is backing the bond. In other words, what the lender will get if the borrower doesn't pay as promised. And in fact, we, uh, we break this down a couple of ways. First of all, we'll talk about collateral. Collateral, we tend to think of as a house for a mortgage or a car for an auto loan. But it's got a more specific meaning with bonds. Collateral actually refers to securities that back a bond. In other words, if the borrower does not pay as promised, the lender will receive a bucket of securities. Now, let's ask this. Would you accept the firm's stock as collateral? You'd be crazy to, because bonds get paid before stock. If they can't pay their bondholders, then their stock is worthless. So what kind of securities do we see being offered up as collateral? Well, United States Treasury bonds are a favorite, or perhaps the bonds of AAA rated industrial firms might also be used as collateral. Mortgage securities use real property as the security for the loan. So this could be a building like a corporate headquarters, could also be a piece of land or even perhaps a piece of large machinery. Now another word we use when talking about debt is debenture. In the U.S., this means an unsecured debt instrument. Now be careful if you go to work in the U.K. or in places like Australia, New Zealand, or India, you will hear the word debenture used for secured debt. So always make sure you know who you're talking to when they start talking about debentures. If they're Americans, that means it's unsecured debt. Now let's talk about notes. In general, note, a note is an unsecured bond with original, mature, original issue maturity between 1 and 10 years. Another item typically mentioned in the bonds indenture is the seniority of the debt. Now, if you've ever had a job where seniority mattered, 
Seniority brought you certain privileges. By the way, on the job, seniority means having been there longer than someone else. And when I was a grocery sacker, seniority gave us the order in which we were able to pick our vacation dates, also told us the order in which we got to go to break. And just like seniority on the job, seniority among debt holders uh, tells you what privileges you have. <clears throat> Typically we have senior, junior, and subordinated debt holders. And the first thing we know is that they get paid in this order, whether we're talking about coupons or the distribution of assets at liquidation of the firm. Which would you rather have? Well, certainly you'd rather have senior debt because it gets paid first. And you would definitely be think that subordinated debt was riskier. So, knowing that riskier debt requires a higher yield to maturity, which of, you, which of these do you think would require the highest yield to maturity? If you said subordinated, you're correct. Now, why would anyone buy subordinated debt knowing that they were behind the senior and perhaps junior debt holders in line for assets at liquidation? Well, perhaps they have a higher tolerance for risk and perhaps they would like the higher reward. It turns out that there are investors that are willing to invest in each of these as long as the interest is enough to reward them for taking on the additional risk. Next, let's talk about the repayment arrangements for the debt. If you don't have any repayment arrangements, no principal is paid back until the bond matures. Recall that bonds are interest-only loans, and so only interest payments are made until the very end, and then the entire amount of the principal comes due. If we have something called a sinking fund, however, that allows the bond issuer to actually pay down the principal of the debt over the life. How does this work? Well, the bond issuer sets aside a certain amount of funds to periodically repurchase a portion of the bonds. Now, each bond will still have a face value of $1,000. It's not that we're going to pay down $200 of your $1,000 face value. We're simply going to repurchase a portion of the bonds. And that would leave the remainder of the bonds out there to continue to mature. And what this does is allows us to pay down the principal of the issue over the bond's life. Now how do we repurchase the bonds if we are the bond issuer? Well, if our bonds are traded out in the open market, we can just buy them out there in the open market. Or if they're not traded in the open market, we'd need to have some sort of call provision, which we'll discuss shortly, in order to force bondholders to sell their bonds back to us. Now the sinking fund reduces the risk of a bond issue. Why? Well think about it this way. If you've got someone that owes you a bunch of money and they're waiting until the end of 30 years to pay it back, what are the chances that they're going to be able to make that entire payment at one time? That's like one of these balloon payment mortgages. On the other hand, if they've been whittling down that principal over time, it's far more likely that they'll be able to pay the bond issue off in full. Therefore, the presence of a sinking fund, which is a repayment provision, reduces the risk of a bond issue. What do you think this does to the yield to maturity the market requires for these bonds? Well, as risk goes down, we know that the required yield of maturity goes down too. Okay, in the last slide we talked about a call provision, and this is a way that the bond issuer can force the bond holder to sell their bond back. Now, this is an option. We, by option we mean the right but not the obligation. The bond issuer has the right but not the obligation to repurchase the bond at a set amount above the face value. That amount above the face value we refer to as the call premium. Now if this call provision is delayed for a while, that's a deferred call provision. 
That gives time at the beginning of the bond life where the bond is protected from being called. Because after all, you would not want to invest your money and then three days later have your bond called out from underneath you. So when would it be advantageous for a bond issuer to call a bond? Well, let's think about this. They're going to have to pay face value plus a certain amount of money to be able to call this bond. That means that the bond uh, would be a premium bond. It would only make sense for them to call the bond if the bond was actually worth more than face value plus the call premium. When is a bond going to be worth more than the face value plus the call premium? When interest rates have fallen substantially. Now why is that the worst possible time for a bondholder to have their bond called? Do you remember something called reinvestment risk? That's the risk that you're going to have to reinvest the proceeds from a bond at a lower interest rate. Well, low interest rates is what made the bond of a higher value. It's what made the bond worth calling, so that means now we're going to have to reinvest this money we, were, we have received at a lower interest rate. That's, that's additional risk. Now what do you think happens to the required yield to maturity as a result of a bond having a call provision? Well, given that you've got this call risk now, definitely the yield to maturity for such a bond would have to be higher than the yield to maturity for a bond without such a provision. Let me give you an example. Back after, after September 11th, um, the Federal Reserve lowered interest rates quite a bit to try to stimulate the economy. And at the time, some elderly ladies down in Florida, this is a story from the Wall Street Journal, by the way, some elderly ladies down in Florida um, had some bonds that matured. And they went to their broker to see about reinvesting the bonds. Now, the bonds had been purchased back when interest rates were much, much higher, and so the coupons had been quite healthy on those bonds. But the new bonds that they were able to buy at the time had much lower coupon rates because interest rates had fallen so much. Now, the broker who was selling the bonds to the little old ladies said, well, I do have some bonds over here that pay a slightly higher yield to maturity. They're otherwise identical to the bonds that we're considering, but they pay a little more. Now, the little old ladies, of course, thought this was a good deal, and so they invested their money in these slightly higher yielding bonds. Now, what the broker failed to tell the little old ladies was that the bonds were callable bonds. And as interest rates fell even further, it became worthwhile for the issuer of the newer bonds to call those bonds. And once again, the little old ladies are left trying to reinvest their money at an even lower interest rate. That's reinvestment risk. One little old lady complained bitterly, I can only afford to eat at the country club once per week now. There is the danger of buying a callable bond. If you own a home, you may already be familiar with protective covenants. For instance, in my neighborhood, it's against the rules to leave your garage door up for more than an hour at a time unless you are constantly moving in and out of the garage. I think I'm also prohibited from having a pink flamingo in my front yard. And so these are rules that people agree to abide by when they enter into an agreement. And it's true also with the bond indenture. It'll have clauses in it meant to protect the bondholders, which are the lenders. Negative covenants say what the bond issuer is not allowed to do. And positive covenants say what the bond issuer must do. Let's take a look at some examples of both. Here are some examples of negative covenants. Firms must limit dividend payments. Now, why would bondholders care about dividend payments? Well, first of all, dividend payments use up cash that could be helpful in making coupon payments and principal payment, the final payment, on bonds. But even more sinisterly, firms could issue a large amount of debt 
and then pay out that entire amount as a special dividend to their shareholders. Then they could file bankruptcy. And that would cause a transfer of wealth from the shareholder from the bondholders to the shareholders. And so it's perfectly understandable why bondholders would want to limit dividend payments. Firms also cannot pledge assets to other lenders. If I have loaned you money based on all of the assets of your firm, it would not be right for you to go pledge those assets to someone else. If you fail to pay either one of us, then a fight would break out as to who actually controlled the assets. And so the borrower must promise not to pledge assets to other lenders. Sometimes you'll see a negative covenant that says that the firm cannot merge with another firm. Keep in mind that the yield of maturity required by investors has a lot to do with the risk of the firm. So imagine if you own shares in a, or not shares, if you owned bonds from a dairy that had a fixed price contract with the state government for 10 years to supply milk to schools. That's a fairly safe kind of thing, and you might only require 6 or 7% to own such bonds. Now, what if that firm decided to merge with a firm that was into nuclear waste disposal? Does the new merge firm have a higher amount of risk than the dairy? Absolutely. What would happen to the required return on the debt as a result? Well, it would definitely go up. And what happens when required returns on bonds go up? The value of the bond goes down, which would lead to a capital loss for anyone who bought the bond back when the firm was merely a dairy. And so we can perfectly see why firms would not be allowed to merge with another firm. Now let's get one thing straight here. This is a sampling of example negative covenants. Not every indenture will contain these, so don't be concerned that every single one of these has to be in every single indenture. Here's another one. The firm cannot sell or lease major assets without lender approval. Why would they be concerned? Well, I'll give you an example. A grade school friend of mine went to work for a company called Calpine out in California. And Calpine made some large bond issues to build some power plants. And those power plants served as the security for the bonds. In other words, if Calpine did not make the payments on the bonds, then the bondholders could take over the power plants. Well, Calpine actually sold the power plants and did not bother to pay off the bonds. This suddenly made the debt go from being secured and relatively safe to unsecured and relatively risky. As a result, if the debt continued to trade, people would require a much higher yield to maturity. So what did the bondholders do? Well, they forced Calpine into bankruptcy so they could liquidate the assets and get as much of their money back as possible. And then finally, we see that firms cannot issue additional long-term debt. Now, we typically see this in the covenants of smaller issuers. No one is going to be able to get this into a bond issue from, say, General Electric, because General Electric issues debt all the time. You're not going to get them to agree to this. But if it's a small company and you are a large lender, then perhaps you can get this in here. Now, why would you not want them to issue additional long-term debt? Well, the more debt they have, the more likely it is that they'll encounter financial distress the more likely the firm will go into bankruptcy and the less likely you'll be able to get all of your money back as a lender. Here are some examples of positive covenants. Firms must maintain net working capital at or above a stated minimum level. If you're a long-term debt holder, why would you care about net working capital? Well, it turns out that if net working capital is too low, then it's possible that the borrower might not be able to pay their suppliers. And if they don't pay their suppliers, the suppliers could force them into bankruptcy, at which point the assets would be liquidated and you might get less than 100% of your money back.
And so one of the things we can do is uh, insist that the borrower maintain their networking capital at or above a stated minimum level. Now how do we know what their networking capital is? Well, we're going to require them to periodically furnish audited financial statements to the bondholders. Now, why do we want the financial statements? So we can see whether or not they are keeping their uh, positive covenants. And secondly, why do we require them to be audited? Well, that's because people cook the books all the time. Now, auditing does not prevent fraudulent accounting, but it helps to diminish the opportunity for fraudulent accounting. We still see fraudulent accounting with auditors in place. Examples, Enron, WorldCom. But auditing of the financial statements actually helps to increase the likelihood that the statements are correct. And finally, the firm must maintain any collateral or security in good condition. Why would the lender care? Well, because if the borrower doesn't pay, the lender will take possession of the collateral or security, and then they will have to try to sell it to get their money back. If it's in good condition, they'll be able to get a lot of their money back. If it's in bad condition, they won't be able to get much of their money back. I once had a friend who knew that his car was going to be repossessed, and he, in fact, had a tip-off on what day it was going to be. And so he actually poured a Dr. Pepper into the crankcase of the car. Now, what did this achieve? I have no idea. But he was not maintaining his collateral or security in good condition. My mortgage papers actually forbid me from having a puppy mill in my house. Now, what's a puppy mill? It's a high-volume dog breeding operation. Why would they care if I had a puppy mill in my house? Well, if you've ever smelled a house that had dozens of dogs in it, it's not pleasant, and that smells very hard to get rid of, and it reduces the value of the property. By forbidding me to have a puppy mill, the bank is hoping that I will maintain the collateral in good condition, and that if they have to foreclose on the house, the house will sell at or near its full market value. Now we'll talk about bond ratings. They supposedly rep represent a combination of default risk and probability of recovery given default. Let's talk about those two things. Default risk is the risk that the borrower is going to default on the loan in some way. Now, the usual method of default is not paying as promised, but violation of the covenants of the bond would also be a technical default. Now, if the borrower does default, then we have to start thinking about getting our money back, and that process is called recovery. And so the second thing that bond ratings represent is the probability of recovery given default. If I loan someone money to buy a car, and the car is the security for the loan, um, the probability of recovery given default is fairly good because I could repossess the car. But what if I loaned money to someone so they could take their family on vacation? And then after the vacation was over, they decided not to pay. My probability of recovery given a default would be fairly low. Now the ratings are issued by ratings firms, Standard & Poor's, Moody's, and Fitch. Now we've seen these people make mistakes in rating bonds in recent history. For instance, many of the mortgage-backed securities that led to our latest financial crisis received top ratings by all three bond rating firms, when in fact they were far, far riskier than the top rating would, rec would represent. Now, some of these some firms will actually pay to have their bonds rated. If you were an issuer of bonds, why would you pay to have your bonds rating rated? If your bonds are rated and they're rated high, then that reduces the amount of yield and maturity required by investors. Therefore, it reduces your cost of borrowing. But there's a problem. Could this create a conflict of interest?
could I go to S&P say, I'd like you to raid my bonds? And they say, fine, we'll give them a triple B. I say, hmm, I'm not sure I want you to rate my bonds. Perhaps I'll go somewhere else. What would they be tempted to do? They might be tempted to raise my bond rating in order to keep my business. Thus, this idea of paying to have your bonds rated creates a conflict of interest. We see that the ratings <clears throat> generally get broken down into two tiers, investment grade and junk. Now, junk bonds are, have been named by the marketing folks high yield debt. Now, what does that mean? Well, we know that high yield is related to high risk, and junk sounds like it's risky, so it all makes sense. But high yield debt just sounds so much better when you're trying to sell these instruments to your clients than to say, I have some junk bonds for you. Let's take a look at what ratings actually look like in their tiers. Here we have the ratings schemes for both Moody's and S&P. Notice that they're very similar. Moody's big A, little a, little a is the same as S&P's big A, big A, big A. And Moody's big A, little a is the same as S&P's big A, big A. Generally, we can draw these parallels between the different ratings companies' ratings methods. And here we see anything in blue or green is considered investment grade. And anything in yellow or red is considered junk or high yield debt. Now why, why is it important that a stock be, or not a stock, that a bond be investment grade? Well, some investors such as insurance companies and certain mutual funds and pension plans are only allowed to hold investment grade debt. And so if your debt is investment grade, anyone can own it. But if your, in your debt becomes junk, all the people who were owning your debt that have to hold investment grade debt must immediately sell those bonds. What do you think that does to the value of the bonds? Well, it very definitely drops it. Now, something else I want to point out here is that S&P has an extra rating than Moody's. S&P has something called D. D stands for default. And actually, the C in Moody's stands for the same as C in S&P and D. So those categories are put together for the C in Moody's. Okay, now we're going to talk about some different types of bonds. First of all, governments issue bonds. In the United States, we have basically two types of government bonds. We have ones that are issued by the federal government, and we have ones that are issued by state, county, city, local, more things like that. The ones that are issued by the central government are called federal debt, or debt of the U.S. Treasury. And they generally fall into three categories. There are treasury bills, which are very short term and have no coupons, and a bill is a year or less. Treasury notes that are between one and 10 years and have semi-annual coupons. And treasury bonds, which are greater than 10 years, usually up to 30 years. And those have semi-annual coupons as well. Now this is the debt of the United States government and it is free, the coupon payments are free of state taxes, but not federal tax. In other words, the U.S. government says, states, you can't tax these coupons, but we reserve the right to tax them ourselves, which hardly sounds fair. However, when we look at municipal debt, we see that it's pretty much the opposite. Uh, they are free of federal tax, and if you live in the same state where they're issued, usually the state tax as well. For instance, I'm a resident of Missouri. If I buy a municipal bond issued in Missouri, then I pay neither fe federal nor state tax. However, if I were an Arkansas resident and bought the same bond, it's likely that I would have to pay Arkansas state income tax on the coupons of that bond. Now, who issues these things? Well. Anything smaller than the federal government. So we've got states, counties, cities, special districts, like special road districts, special sewer districts, uh, 
um, special water districts. And what's the money used for? Well, typically at the city, county, and special district level, we're building highways or schools. School districts are another group that can issue municipal bonds. The new power plant out southwest of Springfield is being built by City Utilities. City Utilities is owned by the City of Springfield and is therefore able to issue municipal bonds. And so that new power plant is being built with $65 million in newly issued municipal bonds. So what does tax-free status do to the required yield to maturity? Well, <clears throat> first of all, let's ask ourselves, what are investors interested in? They're interested in after-tax return. Just like when you get your paycheck, what number do you look at first? Do you look at the big number before they take out all the taxes and whatever else? No, you look at the little number. That's what's going to be deposited in your account or the amount you can trade the check for. And similarly, bond investors are interested in after-tax return. Well, bonds which do not incur taxes don't have to return as much because the after-tax return would be higher. We actually have a formula that tells us what the relationship is between the interest rates on municipal bonds, which are federally tax-free, and the interest required on an otherwise identical taxable bond. Now, that's a mouthful. Otherwise identical has to have the same coupon rate, same maturity, same default risk, everything else equal except for being taxable. And finally, we have big T, the marginal tax rate of the investor. That's the tax rate the investor is going to pay on the very next dollar earned. And the formula is I sub n is equal to I sub t multiplied by 1 minus t. Now let's think about this. If you had a tax rate of 30% and an otherwise identical taxable bond was paying 10%, what would a municipal bond have to be paying for you to be indifferent between buying the two bonds? Indifferent means you would choose either one equally. Well, if we take 1 minus 0.3, that gives us 0.7, multiplied by 10% gives us 7%. So a 7% municipal bond, therefore, would be equivalent to a 10% corporate bond that is otherwise identical. Now, who's going to be the most interested in municipal bonds, low-income people or high-income people? Well, think about this. In the United States, we have what is called a progressive income tax system, which means that poor people's or people with low income, their tax rate's very, very low. In fact, 51% of Americans pay no or they pay negative taxes, which is where they get refunded greater than the amount they, get, they paid in. And so those people, what's their tax rate? Well, it's basically zero. So would they be interested in holding municipal bonds? They wouldn't care. They would rather have a taxable bond because they're not going to pay taxes anyway, and the taxable bond returns more. And so it turns out that the people with the highest tax rates will be most interested in holding municipal bonds. And those are high-income people in countries with progressive income taxes. Now, I've had students from countries before, for instance, I believe Russia, where they have a flat income tax. And in that country, if they had this kind of situation, it wouldn't make any difference whether you were a low-income person or a high-income person. The person that most comes to mind when I think of municipal bonds is Ross Perot. Ross Perot ran for president back in 92 and 96. And one of the things that he ran on was how we were running up all this national debt and people weren't paying enough taxes to keep up with it and we were going to leave a huge debt to our grandchildren. Now, all that said, you would think Ross Perot then would be a big fan of paying federal taxes. Well, it turns out that Ross Perot, after he sold his company, invested all that money in municipal bonds and so his income is federally tax-free which is just a little bit hypocritical. Okay, on to a different type of bond, zero coupon bonds. These bonds don't pay any coupons through their entire lives. 
and therefore all the principal and interest is paid back at maturity. These things always have to be a discount bond because their coupon rate is always zero and the required return by investors will always be positive. Therefore, these things always have to be discount bonds. They're also known as zeros or deep discount bonds. Why deep discount? Because the only way you make money on these things is through the capital gain between what you pay for them and the face value of the bond. Then we have floating rate bonds. These are kind of like adjustable rate mortgages and the coupon rate on these bonds floats with some benchmark interest rate, perhaps the yield on the 10-year treasury bill or treasury bond. As a result, what we see is that these bonds rates, uh, coupons will float to keep close to the required yield of maturity. And the idea here is that the face value of these bonds will stay very close to par value throughout their entire lives. Then we have income bonds. Income bonds are uh, kind of strange in that the borrower only has to pay coupons when their earnings are high enough to cover them. This is kind of like a friend borrowing money from you and telling you, I'll pay you back when I get a job. Well, whether they get a job or not is totally within their control, so they may never pay you back. And so these bonds are really, really risky. In fact, the only time we see them used is by companies that are basically in a death spiral. And so some of my colleagues in finance say that income bonds have the smell of death about them. Then we have convertible bonds. Convertible bonds are really kind of the best of both worlds between bonds and stock. You can accept the constant stream of coupons for the entire life of the bond, just like any other bond. But these bonds also have an option. And the option is that if at some point you want to, you can convert these bonds into stock. Now why would you want to do that? Well, there's really no upside to bond investing. Once you've made your investment, you know what set of payments you're going to get, regardless of how well the company does. It's sort of like my mortgage. My uh, mortgage broker, or my, my bank, can expect to receive the same monthly payment year in, year out, regardless of what happens with my income. My income has gone up considerably since I refinanced my mortgage, let's say. It hasn't really, but let's say that it did. Can the bank call me and say, oh, hey, we hear you're doing pretty well. You need to pay us some additional money on that mortgage. It doesn't work that way. And so regular bonds that you buy are the same way. Even if the company's doing great, you're just going to get a fixed set of coupons. But a convertible bond allows you to convert to the firm's stock. So if the stock price goes up, then it becomes worthwhile to do so. And you're able to participate in the upside of the company. Now, what do you think that does for the required yield to maturity on convertible bonds? It actually makes it lower because you've got this opportunity to participate in the upside. So I'm willing to accept smaller coupons on the off chance that I'll be able to convert my bonds into stock and make a lot more money. And then finally we have put bonds. A put bond allows the bond holder to sell the bond back to the bond issuer at a set amount below par value. In other words, you might pay $1,000 for these bonds, but they say at any time you want, you can sell these bonds back to us for $900. When would it be worthwhile for you to do that? Well, if the yield to maturity on the bonds climbs because of the riskiness of the company, the bond value will fall. And once the bond value falls below $900, then it's worth your while to exercise this put option and make the company buy your bonds back. There's only one problem here. If the company is in a lot of trouble, they may not have the cash to buy your bonds back for the $900. But there's a good chance, there is a, at least a chance that they will. And so the yield to maturity on put bonds is actually lower than a regular bond without that put option because you've got kind of a floor there, a way to limit your losses on the bond.
Let's talk about how bonds are bought and sold. Bond markets aren't like the New York Stock Exchange. Bond markets are more like NASDAQ. Bonds are sold over the counter, or OTC, not to be confused with Ozarks Technical College, which means that they are bought and sold through dealers, not exchanges. So that's a whole lot like NASDAQ. Dealers purchase bonds directly from issu issuers, such as corporations and governments, and then they turn around and sell them to individual investors and funds. Now, we call it making a market when dealers hold an inventory and stand ready to buy at the bid price and sell at the ask price. In other words, you can always do business with a dealer. They'll always be ready to buy your bond. They'll always be ready to sell you a bond, of course, at prices that they set. The difference between this bid and the ask is called the bid-ask spread, and it's how dealers get paid. So it's kind of like buying an apple for 23 cents and selling it for 25 cents. That bid-ask spread is 2 cents, and it would be the profit that the dealer makes. Let's look at how bonds are quoted. Here we have bond quotes from the Wall Street Journal. These are treasury bonds, which is the debt of the United States government. In the first column, we see the maturity date. The first one is June 30th of 2014, and then it goes all the way out to August 15th of 2042. In the second column over, we see the coupon. This is the coupon rate. And so we would have to multiply this coupon rate by the face value of the treasury bond to figure out the annual amount of coupon paid. For example, for November 15, 2021, we have 2% coupons. What that means is that the bond will pay $20 per year. But since treasury bonds pay every six months, what that really means is $10 every six months. On the next column, we have the bid price. Now, there are two prices here, the bid and the ask. The bid is what you would receive if you were to sell your bonds, and the ask is what you would pay if you were going to buy bonds. And the way the dealer makes their money is the difference between the ask and the bid. That's why the ask will always be higher than the bid because you can only make money if you buy things for less and sell them for more. The difference between these two is called the bid-ask spread, and that represents the compensation for the dealer, and that compensation is for the risk that they take on plus the services they provide in making a market in these bonds. Now, another thing to know about how bonds are priced they are priced as a percentage of face value. And so the ask price for the first one, 99.9766, really means 99.9766% of face value. If the face value is 1,000, that means that if you wanted to buy one of these bonds, you would have to spend $999.76 and 6 tenths of a cent. The next column over is the change from the previous day's close. And the change is 0.0156. And once again, this is also in percentage of face value. And so basically, the price of this bond, the ask price, has changed. That change is reported in percentage of face value. So we know that the value of this bond has dropped by roughly 16 cents since the close yesterday. We know it's gone down because the change is in red. If the bond price went down from yesterday to today, what do we know about interest rates in general? They must have gone up because bond prices and bond yield to maturities are inversely proportional. In other words, when bond prices go down, bond yields go up and vice versa. Since we have a price coming down here, we know the yield must have gone up. The final column is the ask yield to maturity. 
Basically, this is the yield and maturity calculated using the ask price for the bond. And we could calculate this number ourselves using our PIBA2 plus calculator if only we knew the date of this quote, but we don't. So we don't know how many coupons each one of these bonds has left to pay and how many days left to maturity. Or we could calculate that ask yield for ourselves. There's a very specific relationship between inflation and interest rates. And here's why. As inflation goes up, the money being paid back by the borrower is worth less and less. And so if you're a rational lender, you're going to include a premium for expected inflation in the interest rate that you charge. Let's talk about the difference between real returns and nominal returns. Real returns represent an increase in purchasing power. For instance, if I invested enough money in the bank today to buy 10 pizzas, and one year from now I had enough money for 11 pizzas, my real return would be 10% because I had a 10% increase in my purchasing power. Now I didn't say anything about how many dollars that was. I mentioned how many pizzas. That was real purchasing power. On the other hand, I could have also talked about nominal returns. They represent an increase in the number of dollars that I will have at that time. Now, if there were no inflation, then nominal returns and real returns would be the same. Let's talk just shortly about what inflation is. Inflation is the tendency of prices to go up over time. And so if inflation is happening, then my real returns will be lower because I won't be able to buy as many units of that good at the end of the debt contract. So we need to figure out how these things are related. And it turns out a famous economist named Fisher came up with this equation. 1 plus big R is equal to 1 plus little r multiplied by 1 plus big H. Where R is the nominal return, that's going to be the increase in the number of dollars. Little r is the real return, which is going to be the increase in your purchasing power. And H is inflation. Now why the H? Are we using H for inflation? Well, if we threw in an I there, people might get confused and think it was some sort of interest rate. And so just like we use K for capital, we use H for inflation when we're talking to economists. Now, if you wanted to approximate this, you could add little r and h together. But that's only an approximation. That's something for you to do on a cocktail napkin with your friends at the bar after hours. It's nothing you would be allowed to use for your homework or your exams in my class. Okay, now we're looking at the term structure of interest rates. And basically that's the relationship between time to maturity and interest rate. Typically, it's upward sloping like we see in the top picture, or A. And there's a good reason for that. Because first of all, we know that the interest rate risk premium is always increasing at a decreasing rate. In other words, it's not getting smaller over time. We know that for sure. And so the interest rate risk premium, it's the same regardless. Inflation premium and real rate, let's assume that they were flat. We would still have an upward sloping term structure. Now, inflation premium is the expected inflation that is priced into interest rates for the different times to maturity. If we look in picture A here, it looks like people expect inflation to be going up over time. And so that further reinforces the upward sloping term structure. Now the real rate is depicted here as flat. We have no reason to believe that the real rate is anything but flat, but it's possible that real rates change over time. But once again, as long as the decline in the real rate and the inflation premium are less than the increase in the interest rate risk premium, the term structure will be upward sloping. So 95% of the time, the term structure of interest rates in the United States looks like picture A. However, on occasion, it looks like picture B. And the big reason is inflation. 
if you're in a period of high inflation and people expect that the Federal Reserve will take serious action to bring inflation down, then you're going to have a downward sloping term structure where people expect inflation to go further down the further out in time you go. Um, let's see, when did we see something like this? How about the early 1980s when Chairman Volcker at the Federal Reserve was fighting inflation, something fierce. How do you fight inflation? You raise short-term interest rates. You make it expensive for people to continue to consume. You make it worthwhile for them to put their money in the bank. And that gets that money off the street so they stop buying stuff with it. So that makes short-term interest rates very high. But because that action kills off inflation, it actually brings long-term interest rates down. And so you'll wind up with this downward sloping term structure. Now here's the problem. Banks make money by borrowing at short maturities and loaning at long maturities. 95% of the time, the term structure is a machine that banks use to print money. The other 5% of the time, however, they're borrowing at high interest rates on the short term and long loaning out at lower interest rates in the long term. That's a recipe for disaster. So each time we see this downward sloping term structure, you're also going to see bank failures. Finally, let's talk about what goes into bond yields. Well, we just got through talking about the term structure of interest rates, and we said that that was composed of the real rate, an inflation premium, and an interest rate risk premium. So there are your first three things that go into bond yields. Beyond that, we have what's called a default risk premium. The more likely someone is to default on their debt, the higher interest rate they're going to have to pay. Remember, in financial markets, and pretty much everywhere else, risk and reward have to go together. So the riskier person you loan to, the more return you're going to demand. Now students often get confused here, and they say, well, if you're loaning money to poor people, you should charge them a lower interest rate because after all, they are poor. In actuality, you should charge them a higher interest rate because it is more likely that they will default. Then there's the taxability premium. I showed you earlier how the return on municipal bonds doesn't have to be as high as the return on taxable bonds because what people are interested in is after-tax return. And finally, there's the liquidity premium. Anything that forces you to lock your money up for a longer period of time means that you are going to require a higher return in exchange for that. Here's an example. If you're a young man and you've got $25,000 and you have decided you won't need that for the next five years, you could buy a municipal bond, let's say, <clears throat> that would be extremely liquid because it's not widely traded, not easily sold. And so you buy that bond and you basically can't get your hands on your money for five years. On the other hand, you could buy a five-year corporate bond, let's say General Electric, and it would be widely traded and you could sell it at pretty much any time you want. Now, as a result, you're not going to demand as much return. Now, why would liquidity or lack of liquidity be a problem? Think about this. The young man we just discussed, his girlfriend says, I think it's time to get married. He says, I think you're right. She says, I think I need an engagement ring. He said, I think you're right. And she says, I have my eye on one at Tiffany. It's $25,000. Now, if he's got the liquid instrument, the corporate bond that he can easily sell, he can easily get his money back to buy the engagement ring. On the other hand, if he has invested in an illiquid municipal bond, it's really going to be hard for him to get his money back before that five-year maturity. And so he turns to his girlfriend and says, I agree you need a ring. However, I have my money invested for five years and can't get it back, so you'll have to wait five years to get your ring. This story always ends with the young man having to find a new girlfriend.